In this second part of the History of the Atom lecture, we're going to talk more about the timeline and the other scientists involved. For the most part, this lecture is just for your information and just sort of for, for fun and um, just interesting, but most of the other information that will be on the quiz is on the first two lectures of this series. So ancient Greece is the first entry on our timeline at around 400 BC, but you can see that there were already a number of elements that had been discovered before the ancient Greeks started making their mark on civilization, such as copper, carbon, silver, iron, gold, mercury. Um, and so we don't know exactly when those were first used, but there's history of them being used throughout the world by very, very ancient civilizations. So in terms of when they were actually discovered, that's why that's on sort of this dotted timeline, because there's no real knowledge of that. But in the future, you'll see that there are other elements that have been marked off, and those roughly are um, accurate, because we do know when those were discovered. So the first scientist we talked about in our previous lecture was Democritus of Greece, and his experiments were interesting in that he... Um, he did a lot of um, breaking of items and he looked at the world around him and took mixtures and separated them and took pure substances um, and broke them down to the smallest pieces he was able to with the technology of his day and he named those smallest particles atomos because he believed that the world was made from fundamental tiny small solid particles and then those small particles would combine in different ways to make the four elements um, it's used in a different way than we use the word element today but the world was made up of earth air fire and water was the belief at the time and he believed that a combination of atoms or atomos individual particles were what contributed to the factors of earth or air or fire or water we're going to fast forward a couple thousand years to the era of the alchemists and in Europe and Asia, the alchemy um, sort of revolution was a very interesting time period where many people turned to quote-unquote chemistry. Some of them actually really did a good um, approximation of what we use for chemistry today, and some people were just charlatans who would charge money and were no better than witch doctors in taking blood and milk and urine and trying to turn them into gold for, for, for noblemen. But many of the techniques and equipment used by scientists of this time are actually still used today, as well as the names and symbols of many of the elements. In fact, some of the symbols we have today are based on ancient alchemic names. These are more the modern names, but for example, antimony had a more... Um, had a different name, Stubnum, back in the days of the alchemists, alchemists, which is where we get the symbol on the periodic table today of antimony being SB. In the 1700s, um, physicist Sir Isaac Newton uh, made his mark and he's also sort of famous for doing the apple dropping experiment and he used math and physics to hypothesize that the universe is composed of small solid bodies that are constantly in motion and based on what we now know of the atom this is very interesting because it is very accurate that is true although he didn't use the term atoms and didn't um, didn't do science in, in terms of chemistry to look at the elements, what he, what he proposed at that time was actually very accurate to, um, to what we know today, that the atoms are small solid bodies. Well, I don't know if we'd say solid, but they are small and they are constantly in motion. Um, towards the late end of that century, Antoine Lavoisier of France, he's dubbed the father of modern chemistry because he was one of the first people that really took the turn in chemistry from the alchemy to pure chemistry. And the difference would be that um, Lavoisier was seeking the, the reason for why things work as opposed to just trying to change something into a new, into a new element. So he coined the more modern version of the word element by naming it as a substance which cannot be broken down by chemical means, which is sort of the definition we use today. Today we know that there are smaller substances or smaller particles than an element or an atom, but in order to get to just a, a a uh, subatomic particle, for example, just a neutron or just a quark, you can't do that by chemical reaction. So his definition still really holds true now 300 some years later. Shortly after the turn of the century, an Englishman named John Dalton revisited Democritus's idea of the solid atom named Atomos. 
And he combined that with the work of scientists of his day, and he wrote an essay which he entitled Atomic Theory. And this was um, a series of tenets of what he believed, or based on the data of others, what he believed about the behavior of atoms. Towards the end of that century, Dmitry Mendeleev, um, who has a really fascinating story if you, if you read that sometime, um, Dmitry Mendeleev was working in Russia and was dubbed the father of the periodic table. He was one of the first people to organize the elements into a chart based on their physical and chemical properties. And he was so strongly believing in these chemical properties that he even found areas where he believed that there were missing elements. And it did turn out that during his lifetime and after his lifetime there were elements that were discovered afterwards that fit into those empty boxes that Mendeleev had predicted. We talked about J.J. Thompson in the previous lectures and his discovery of the electron by using um, a cathode ray tube and um, his discovery or his um, based on based on his discoveries his then design of a new model of the atom called the plum pudding model and um, this was a different atom of the model uh, model of the atom because it went it took science from having a sol a solid particle to a particle of the atom that was not solid and did contain parts and did contain parts that were charged. So this is a very big change from the early model proposed by Democritus and upheld by Dalton to this plum pudding model. During this time Marie Curie and her husband Pierre Curie were doing a lot of work with uh, radioactive elements and they observed radioactivity um, as being basically very large elements with unstable nuclei that would decay and emit tiny radioactive particles. Unfortunately this later caused cancer and she died of cancer not, um, when, not long after when she was still very young. Um, Max Planck around this time in Germany was working with packets of energy and this is sort of a crossover between chemistry and physics and he developed what's called the quantum theory in which there are measurable packets of energy. So sometimes when you hear about quantum physics um, or quantum mechanics they, they kind of stem from this idea that he developed in the 1900s. Scientists in Japan were also working on the atomic model and trying to figure out just what the atom looked like. This um, man, Hantaro Nagaoka, in 1903 developed a Saturnian atomic model. And he was the first one to really depict the idea of electrons being organized and orbiting the nucleus. So rather than them being randomly dispersed in the nucleus as Thompson had proposed in his plum pudding model. The Saturn model, although we don't spend a lot of time, we don't have a lot of focus on that, he really depicted a ring of electrons around a center, but this center had not officially been discovered yet. Seven years later, however, Ernest Rutherford, through his experiments, did discover that there was a central nucleus. And when he discovered this central nucleus through work with alpha particles that he was beaming through a sheet of gold atoms, he found that the alpha particles, most of them went straight through, which tells us that the atom is mostly empty space, but a small portion were deflected. So there must be a solid object which is solid enough and large enough to withstand the momentum of an alpha particle but it must also be positively charged because it did not absorb the alpha particle, but it repelled it. And an alpha particle he knew at that time was positively charged. And also around this time, Albert Einstein um, first made his mark. He had many, many, many discoveries and other things that um, he contributed to science. But um, what's related to the atom was the idea that light is made up of particles. And we see this idea of particles again with Niels Bohr um, and he was revisiting Max Planck's experiments and I, the idea of quantum theory. And so when, when experimenting with excited hydrogen atoms, Bohr found that hydrogen electrons will emit four different wavelengths of light. And each wavelength, which was um, discovered by and sort of made into a, um, a formula called Planck's, for Planck's uh, law. Um, each, each wavelength corresponds to a certain amount of energy. So Bohr had the idea that the electrons must be um, organized into what he called energy levels. 
and that made sense to him because that explains why different amounts of energy can be emitted and it also explains why every element has its own pattern of energy because every element has a different number of electrons and he believed that the electrons were orbiting in these energy levels around the nucleus much like the planets around the Sun so he coined his uh, his model the atom the planetary model we see J.J. Thompson again come back with more experiments and this time he observed evidence of isotopes in experiments with neon where he found that there were two different types of neon atoms and they were set apart from each other by mass and so these isotopes disproved a part of Dalton's atomic theory in which he had stated that atoms of the same element must be identical and so the idea of isotopes disproves that because an, an isotope is an element or an atom of an element that has the same number of protons as its sister isotopes but a different number of neutrons. Shortly thereafter in the 1920s Glenn Seaborg at UC Berkeley with his uh, with colleagues at the Lawrence Berkeley lab we now call that the Lawrence Livermore lab they began synthesizing elements by taking very large and unstable atoms and even the isotopes of those atoms and colliding them with other subatomic particles such as such as uh, neutrons alpha particles beta particles and they found that sometimes those particles would stick to create a larger element and sometimes that larger element would then decay to make another element which is not normally seen in in the universe and so these were called the synthetic elements and numbers 94 through 102 and 104 are also referred to as the transuranium elements because they come after uranium on the periodic table also in that year Warner Heisenberg and Erwin Schrodinger did work to come up with what is generally considered to be the most modern of the mechanical or of the models of the atom and their model is called the quantum mechanical model and they used um, much like Einstein they used a lot of physics and math and they were able to predict the location of electrons based on probability and three-dimensional graphing so they stated that, um, that Bohr's hypothesis was not correct because if an atom travel, traveled predictably in orbit you would be able to find it at any given moment however they said that electrons are not um, predictable they travel unpredictably however there are areas where they are likely to be found and less likely to be found and we'll talk about the quantum mechanical model and its details in a later unit Shortly thereafter in England, Sir James Chadwick was doing research with um, subatomic particles and he found radioactive decay particles that were neither part that were neither positive nor neutral. And so there must be a neutral particle which he named the neutron. And we now know that different numbers of neutrons is what causes different isotopes. Finally, we end our timeline in um, 1934 with the discovery of nuclear fission by Otto Hahn and Lise Meitner. And then Murray Gell-Mann uh, theorizing that subatomic particles are actually made of quarks. And you'll learn about that more in physics, but we now know that uh, the proton, neutron, electron are not the smallest particles. There are up quarks, down quarks, muons, um, neutrinos, and a number of other quarks that you'll learn about. Finally, we have a question mark here where we don't know what the future is going to be. Um, recently, there were some new elements that have been that have come out of labs in Russia and in Germany. But in the future, who knows if we're going to find more elements or if more will be discovered in space or if more will be synthesized um, in labs. So a very interesting account of how these elements are synthesized and sort of the international race to make elements and discover them is in the book The Disappearing Spoon by Sam Keen and I've provided his website here. And this is a very interesting, amusing account of how the different elements in the periodic table are found and used if you would like to look that up.